So a large part of what I do is to try to bring out the greatness in women. I run a school, it's a school of coaching and transformation. And this idea about like the, the innate greatness and the innate holiness of every person is something that I'm so, I'm so passionate about. Like it's when I see people, that's what I see. I see that potential, I see that greatness and it actually gets me very excited. So I'd like to ask you, what message does Hashem, does God give us about people's innate greatness and part B, innate holiness? Great question. Uh, I would uh, I would take it a step further mm -hmm. and say it's not just what God gives us, our very essence, our very beings, what really defines who you and I are is the fact that we were created in the, we were created in the divine image. The first time the Bible, the Torah describes the human being, it says the human being, male and female, God created the human being in the divine image. Now, what does this word divine image mean? So very simple English. You know, we live in a world where we have many impermanent things, the food we eat, the money we make, even life itself is subject to mortality, to changes, to all kinds of even super superficiality, things that are not permanent, that are not eternal. The mere creation of a human being, you, Mm -hmm. And I, and each individual, is a declaration and a statement that you have a piece of eternity within you. Mm. That your actions, your choices, your behavior, your decisions, everything about you is not just a fleeting event that uh, will come and go. What you do right now will live on forever, will impact you, your family, your community for eternity essentially is the greatest gift you can have because most people ask that question, how significant am I? You know, among 8 billion people, who am I? Right. Like a grain of sand on the beach, mm -hmm. one among trillions. No, but that's not correct. You're unique, you're indispensable, you matter, not just to you and your loved ones, yeah. but to the entire universe and the world could not be complete without you living up to your calling. So that mm. is the greatest gift that a human being can have. That's how I understand mm. you know, the divine image that each one of us carries. Mm. So beautiful, so beautiful. Um, I'd like to share this idea, like as I've been thinking about the divine image. So I keep thinking and I am like bouncing my thought off of you so you can comment on it and tell me where it fits in with, you know. Sure. I keep thinking Hashem, God is everything. And we are his radiance. We are that piece of him, right? So for sure, the world is not complete without any of us because we are, we are that, we are the God stuff. Our completion is God's completion. So then these are the words. That would mean that we are God's hands and feet, so to speak. In other words, Hashem has mercy to give to the world and he uses us to give that mercy. Hashem has a smile that he wants to give to you. He uses me or, or the next one to give that smile essentially like the more that we realize that we are literally a piece of God the more we allow our physical life here to matter because we are we are his hands and feet what could you say about that yeah that's well said I would uh, just uh, embellish on it a bit Please. I would add that uh, I like the analogy that we're all indispensable musical notes in one cosmic divine symphony. Mm. And as you said, each one of us is God's arms and legs and mouthpiece. Mm -hmm. And you have two choices in life all the time, 24 seven, you have two choices. Mm -hmm. Are you going to align yourself to be that channel that draws down divine energy into existence? Like you just said, being a kind person, a giving person, channeling divine kindness into life, into others. Or, God forbid, the other extreme where you just say, I'll take care of myself. You know, I often ask people, I say, so who are you? And when you ask someone, who are you? Many people give you their business card. But I said, a business card, that's what you do. That's not who you are. Mm -mm. It's what you do. And sadly, some people say, well, what I do has become who I am. Mm -hmm. No, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. In the beginning of the Bible, the same story, when Adam, for the first time, betrays himself and betrays his calling, God says to him, where are you? 
Ayeka in Hebrew, where are you? Now, of course, God knew where he was physically. It was a cosmic question. It was a spiritual question. It was a psychological question. Sometimes you're sitting with someone, you see them, but they're spaced out. You don't feel, you say, where are you? Where's your uh, mind? Where's your heart? I don't feel that you're aligned with the purpose for which I created you. Mm -hmm. So in essence, that's exactly right. Each of us has a destiny, but the difference is we have given free will and free will allows you to choose. The objective of the free will is obviously we should be wise enough to understand that we indeed have the ability and the potential and the capacity to channel divine wisdom, divine love, divine kindness and compassion in this world. And when we do that, there's a full alignment between who you are and what you do. Mm. Yes. Wow. Beautiful. You know, when you're talking, I'm thinking about, I'm really thinking about my journey of healing and how long it takes to realize that you're indispensable because life, life has its pains and its hurts and not every relationship tells you that you're indispensable and that every childhood experience makes you feel important and special. So understanding that we are that important to the scheme of things really is a journey. It's like a, um, it's like we need to learn about it, but then we need to learn about it through practice, through showing up to life again and again and saying, yes, I do matter. Yes, what I, I put myself out or I did another good deed and I see like I'm taller, I'm stronger, I'm more, I'm, there's more godly self in there. I am making a difference. Absolutely. Um, and, and you said it well. I mean, one of our true challenges is that we often get messages, even in childhood, or educators or the media that um, you don't have that value, that inherent value. You know, when a child is criticized, is judged, mm -hmm. is invalidated, it undermines that divine image of that indispensability that you are. So we're not in a neutral state. You said it accurately. So part of the work, I, mean, I would say a major part of the work is undoing and countering those voices that tell you you can't do it, that you're hopeless, resignation, cynicism. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's a big part of life that we live in a world where others can send us such messages when in truth, inside of you is beating a healthy heart, a healthy voice that says you absolutely matter. So we're dealing with a battle here. It is a battle. Yeah. It's a battle over your psyche, over who's gonna control your uh, mood, your consciousness. And it could be those negative voices or surrounded by people that encourage you and say you can achieve anything you set your mind to and recognize that you have that inherent value. But it's not mm -hmm. easy. In a hostile world, we have a world of predators, of people who use and exploit. So we have to know how to really allow and have the courage to express that unique voice and not let it not be drowned out by others' expectations and demands and judgments and so on. Right. You have to stand up and be who you're meant to be. Yeah. So I want to talk about this idea of battle for a minute. I actually battle with battle. I'll tell you why. Um, sometimes there is a there is a force that wants to take you away from God. We see that force in the serpent right away in the in the Garden of Eden, right? right. We, we bat, we're meant to battle that force. There's no question about it. So here's an idea that um, is meaningful to me in healing, and I'd love for you to comment on it. I'll see sure. if I can condense it. But it goes like this, that childhood slash media early experiences create a negativity, and uh, let's say a distortion, that's there on purpose. That is That sets the stage for the battle, yes? Now you know, um, I was criticized and told that I'm a good for nothing. Well, guess what? Within the battle of battling the message of I'm a good for nothing, I become a magnificent something. So that's okay. So then the idea is that it's that there, why would a loving God create an existence where you automatically are going to face toxicity and distortion? Like I created you perfect and beautiful, a piece of me. I'll put you in an environment that will tell you you're junk. Why? Perhaps, just follow me here, that um, it's this place, this particular distortion distortion, and everyone has at least one, but like usually a pretty big one, that it's in this exact distortion 
that God wants to call you close, that right in there, in battling with that message, you'll find out that all along, the, the truest thing is the exact opposite of that message. And in, in battling it, you'll find a closeness with Hashem that, that, um, that is like an Evan Ma'asu Habanim Hoysel Rosh Pina, that the cornerstone, this like this, this piece of ugliness actually becomes that which you build your entire life around. So just to, to finish off, the idea is that, yes, there is a battle, but it's a battle for love, not a battle of only against the negativity, but every time you clarify for yourself, no, I'm not that. I am to God. No, I'm not that. I am love to God. I am worthy. I am cherished. Then, um, then that's the point of existence, closeness to Hashem. So it's in the battle that is life itself. So the whole thing is a healing journey and the work is the healing, not the work comes after the healing. Okay, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I often ask people, if you had one request of God, what would it be? And I give mm -hmm. them two options. One option is that you should have a life of no challenges, of no setbacks, of no uh, obstacles, yeah. and no impediments. Or the second option is that you may have many challenges and obstacles, but please, God, give me all the strength and the resources to deal with anything that comes my way. So, of course, the initial knee-jerk and even immature request is always going to be number one, just make my life absolutely uh, mm -hmm. effortless. Mm -hmm. But the mature response will, of course, be, no, give me challenges, but give me the strength and know that I have the confidence in my strength to deal with anything. Mm -hmm. Look, we'll use a parenting example. Imagine a child learning to walk, a crawling child is starting to walk, and the mother or father is so compassionate, they don't want their child ever to slip or fall. And you hold your child all the time, make sure they don't fall. What will happen? the child will never learn to walk on their own because they're always dependent on someone holding them. Or what a good and healthy parent does is I'm here for you, walk toward me. Mm -hmm. And the child may fall. They'll fall many times before they walk straight, but you're there for them and you show them the confidence and the love. You've taught them to stand on their own feet. Yeah. What God has said to us is I will give you challenges, but I know that's coming from love because I want you to not be a robot or a puppet mm -hmm. and just follow my orders and just I'll pull the strings. No, I want you to initiate, to generate. You have much to give, but to give comes with another side. It comes with recognizing that you have to sometimes initiate and do it on your own, knowing that God gives us the strengths. So it's yeah. a far, far greater blessing of love when we have confidence in people and say, I have confidence that yes, you may make a mistake or two, you may have a setback or two, but in the big picture, you will forge ahead and you will prevail. And then as the Talmud says, that a person has much more pleasure with $1 that they earn on their own than $9 that's given as a gift. Now with $9 or $9,000, you can buy a lot more than $1,000, but it's not yours. And therefore you'll blow it quicker as well. When it's you, means you, the effort has such powerful value. And that's the gift of life. The that life is. comes with challenges, but it comes for every challenge, you get an equal amount or more strength to deal with those challenges. Beautiful. So uh, Hashem, God wants to give us the gift of ourselves. That's what I'm hearing from you. That is so yes. beautiful. And that you make your mark. You have something to contribute. You imagine finding out that your whole life you're just a puppet, that God is doing everything and you don't use it. What would be the purpose? What would be the value? Who needs that? But um, not being a robot, being an original comes with a certain price, the price of being yourself. Yeah. 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 Stunning. I love that analogy of the, of the babies learning to walk. Because the parent who like keeps a distance, like a purposeful distance, it doesn't look kind to the untrained eye. It just looks like pick the kid up, he's falling, you know? Right. And then yeah. actually, what does the parent do? They move a little further back, you know? 
So there's a beautiful analogy I could share. Yeah, go ahead. And, Analogies are so powerful. Yeah, where we all know that a caterpillar goes into the chrysalis, into a cocoon before it turns into a beautiful butterfly. Yeah. So here we are, the end of the process, the cocoon is about to open up and an individual, someone, a compassionate soul sees a butterfly, a beautiful monarch butterfly trying to get out of the chrysalis. Like, you know, it's like it's, it's, it's stuck, it's struggling. So in his great mercy, what he does is he brings a knife, cuts open the cocoon and the beautiful butterfly emerges. But lo and behold, to his chagrin, the butterfly will not fly. It will mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. What happened was that part of the way the butterfly develops the aerodynamics to be able to fly is the pressure that is generated when the butterfly is struggling to mm -hmm. get liquid into its wings. Mm -hmm. so the fellow who in his own ignorance didn't understand he took away from that, took, he, he prevented the butterfly from those last steps of struggle and the liquid never got into its wings. So it was a beautiful butterfly stuck on a branch. Mm. The struggles of life in the right context, and we should all have minimal struggles. I'm not advocating for challenges, but we have to realize that every struggle brings out deeper strengths and deeper energy that allows you to fly and soar to places you could never reach did you not have that pressure. So true. And resistance, yeah. Yeah, really, really true. It's such a moving analogy. Um, sometimes I think of things, like 99% of the time, I think of things in terms of the male and female. Um, and I remember years and years ago, probably two decades ago, your 10-part series on the male-female dynamic. It was so, it's such an impression on me. And I continue to deepen that learning. So what I want to say about this, just from working with women so much, is that there is a message that we need, especially in struggle, of you are getting stronger. You are becoming. Every second you're becoming, every powerful action you take is God's gift to you of yourself, like the butterfly that has to battle to get out. And I also want to offer something that I um, like to pair that with what I said earlier, which is that there is the feminine healing of just knowing that you're loved that makes that possible. That the inner healing of like, you know, how does God really truly, truly feel about me that makes mm -hmm. all that work palatable because purpose without, without love is not joyous, it's hard work. So we really deeply wanna like, um, it's not enough to learn. We want to heal. We want to heal those messages, all of them, that say that we are anything less than truly loved in Hashem's eyes, because only a loving God would believe in us that much. Yeah, yeah beautifully stated. I want to say to uh, important to represent the masculine energy as well. And yeah. I want to say this: the fact of the matter is that all of us, male and female, yeah. all have a masculine dimension and a feminine dimension. Yes. What we can learn much about in this aggressive and sometimes ego-driven world from feminine energy is that love is not just a verb, but love is a state of being. It's a noun. And women experience love much more like a state of being. Many yeah. men experience more like an action, a verb. Interesting. So you're saying both can be love. Oh, I love this. Wait a minute. Because really, like, I'm deep in the women's work. You're saying it's all love. What, what I see is Gevura, which is discipline and like the proactive action or seeing God as kind of working you like a coach, that is love and action. And then the feminine experiences the love and being. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like Beautiful. the woman is the one encompasses another life, nurtures yeah. pregnancy. It's like almost like water. When you go into water, you're submerged in it. Yeah. And men are far more focused on action and, and doing things. Now, Obviously, they join together, and when they fuse, you have a most beautiful uh, dynamic, which is what God wanted in the first place, male and female, complementing each other, soulmates, joining together. But the feminine energy is far underappreciated in our day and age. Mm. And uh, if women ran the world, we would have a very better and much more spiritual and a much more refined world, I believe. I'm a big mm. uh, fan of the feminine. <laughs> it's wonderful. It's so wonderful. It's a... Uh... To honor both, you know, we need both. 
Uh, yeah. I have a, another question. I have another question for you. We okay. can go on. Let's do it. So um, we talk about, actually in our school, we talk about your divine inner wisdom, meaning that when you are in a mentorship or coach or even sometimes a friend position and someone comes and asks you what to do, the first place you wanna point them to is their inner self, their answer, the divine inner wisdom. Um, with, the, uh, with the understanding that Hashem, God, uh, is in them, within them, orchestrated their life and gave them what they need. Sometimes what they need is you to help guide them and give them the answers, but the deepest truth is within themselves. Um, what can you say about divine inner wisdom? And I will share, actually, I would like to share one analogy with you since we're on analogies today. I learned this from a teacher once that accessing your divine inner wisdom slash your intuition is something like this. And I'd like you to comment on this too. They said that uh, you, you are like a house and imagine a house that is like so cluttered, like a hoarder. You got your piles of paper and your furniture and there's windows, but the light can barely get in because there's a big bookshelf and there's couches and it's just very, very impossible to move in there. But as you heal these distortions, as you heal into the recognition of who you are and who God is and what life is, it's as if you're clearing away the furniture. Yes, I am love. Yes, life has purpose. Yes, I matter. Yes, there is a God. Yes, he is loving. Yes, he is merciful. Yes, life can be good. Yes, I am not alone. And as you clear these away, there's more room for the light. So therefore, as you heal, you can trust that divine inner wisdom more. Um, so these are just some ideas. And I know you just have great things to add and couch. So let me know what you think about them. Well, there's a beautiful Talmudic statement, which I believe were applied and turned into a psychological model. It is transformational, revolutionary. Mm -hmm. The statement states the following, that when a child is developing in its mother's womb, the fetus in pregnancy. So we know there's the physiological and uh, the physical development of this new life. Mm -hmm. But the Talmud says the following, that throughout those nine months of pregnancy or whatever the amount of time, all the divine knowledge that you will ever need in life and beyond is downloaded into your inner psyche, into your DNA. The words of the Talmud that the entire Torah is taught to this child. And that upon birth, when the child is about to emerge from the womb into this world, an angel comes and says, shh, silences that wisdom, means that wisdom recedes back into our unconscious. That's why we have a cleft over our mm -hmm. upper lip. It's like the quiet, the silence. And now as we're born and go into this world, so embedded within us is all that knowledge, but now we have to discover it. That's why we have the concept of resonance, resonance. You ever mm -hmm. see even newborns, and today's studies show that even babies in the womb will respond to music, you play mm -hmm. music. You have seen mm -hmm. an infant in the mother's womb moving to the music. The question is, how does it know music? Even language is a miracle, but that you can say after two, three years, the child picks up from parents and so on. But music, because the language of the soul is music. That's how a soul communicates. That's how a soul travels. So all the music and all this knowledge is embedded within us. And as we grow older, and you hear sometimes a truth and you say, ah, yeah. that resonates with you. Why is it resonating? Because it's already inside of you, which I always tell people, you don't, everything you need is within you. The only problem is it's uh, sealed. It's covered up. You know, Michelangelo put it beautifully when they asked him, how do you sculpt those beautiful angels in the marble? Michelangelo, the great sculptor. Yeah. And his answer was, I see the angel trapped in the marble and I carve and carve and set her free. In other words, it's all there. You just have to carve away yeah. the marble, the concrete, yeah. the other substances that pollute mm. and toxify our lives. Mm -hmm. But it's all there. The beautiful child is always there throughout mm. your whole life. Unfortunately, layers, toxics, toxins enter, 
And that's why you see children when they're very newborns or young children, you see they breathe. You see their chest heaving up and down because their lungs are completely pure. But then look at adults. We use 70, 80% of our lungs because toxins begin to pollute mm. us. Yeah. So it's about cutting away these layers and discovering those inner truths that resonate within each one of us. Beautiful. So beautiful. So beautiful. So actually it's the same analogy, moving out the furniture, cutting away the extra things, getting to the beautiful child within. Um, it's so beautiful. That means that if the, if when the furniture is gone, there is light. And when this external stuff is gone, then there's the beautiful child and there's the masterpiece that was always there. Then there's the truth that was implanted inside of you. So then Absolutely. human beings really are that. What are we essentially? The light, the beautiful child. That's our essential selves. This truth, I will tell you, affects all my life, my whole work, because communication is not about trying to teach people new ideas. It's right. about trying to get rid of the distractions and allowing their inner truth to emerge. It's a very different way of teaching, of educating and inspiring. Yes. Looking for that, that kernel, that spark, that, that resonates within each person. Right. It's like, just if I could wake you up to yourself for a moment, then it'll all make sense. It'll settle inside of you. In my introduction to Torah Meaning Flef, I write the greatest compliment you can give someone is not that I've heard something new, but I've always known this truth, but thank you for helping me articulate. Yes, wow, wow. Okay, ready for a personal question? <laughs> I thought yeah. all this was personal, by the way. All this was personal, yeah. Um, it's a curiosity question. So a lot of our audience is listening to you for the first time and I'm so excited that they get to meet you. And you really are a global visionary. And I would like to know what drives you. And by the way, when we got on this, um, this conversation, this interview slash conversation, Rabbi Jacobson said, I do about seven of these a day. So, <laughs> That's, that's a lot of energy, that's a lot of passion, and I want to know what drives you. It's an excellent question. I don't know if I have a complete rational answer, to be honest. <laughs> I think any type of drive that is really relentless and does not allow itself to be affected by the mood, by the weather, by attitudes, is, comes from a very deep place that we're discussing, which is very much the calling of your soul. I was always a skeptic by nature. I was always even cynical at times. And I always wondered and questioned, I always challenged the conformity and the mediocrity around mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. And there's some, something driving inside of me that I always felt like I was a, I guess as a teenager, I could call myself a rebel without a cause. Yes. I had that rebellious, very powerful yes, energy. I relate to that. Yeah, didn't know what to do with it, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Couldn't really speak to many people because then they just see you as a troublemaker and just, you know, disruption. And uh, it was inside of me. And then when I began to really learn the, the, and of course, I grew up in the yeshiva world, studied Talmud, studied the Bible, Chumash, Torah, everything. But it was all still, it was, it didn't, what can I tell you? It didn't resonate yet. When I began to learn the more the mystical, the Hasidic, dimension, it was like music to my soul. Mm. And music, like you'd ask the question, what drives you when you listen to music? Right. I can't really answer that question. It's something that just touches a part of you that you just feel, I'm in, this is me. Mm -hmm. And I discovered that and I never looked back. And uh, it drives me. I, I thank, of course, influences in my life, like the Lubavitcher Rebbe, who spoke this language of music that spoke to me my father, my parents, my mother, Yibad L'chaim L'chaim, my father's in heaven, and different individuals that um, had that capacity to reach those inner truths. And I'm also an extremist. If I'm in, I'm in all the way. If yeah. I'm not, I'm not. Yeah. Either anarchy or total revolution, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. So once I was in, I said, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm in. And I, I didn't look, I wanted to do it completely. And till this day, nothing has changed. I'm still that 17 year old. I, you know, excited to jump out of bed 
I can't even barely sleep at times because I'm really driven and motivated. And I really feel that a life is meant to live to the fullest as much as possible. Trust me, we all have our challenges. I have my own. But overall, that's the engine. And I feel it's like, you know, I was just studying a text about, about um, battle. We talk about battles, but in a good way, a good battle. What a battle does is it focuses you, laser energy, clarity. You know exactly what you need to achieve. You know what the goal is, and you want to triumph. So obviously, not physical battles or bloody battles, but spiritual battles. We live in a world that, is unfortunately, has a lot of confusion, a lot of distraction, so many materialistic comforts that obfuscate that search for the spiritual truths. Yeah. And when I see that, it's like a real need. I feel it's like a battle between a world of deception, of duplicity, and truth. So it really drives me, and I, uh, that's, what, that's really what it comes down to. Mm. Wow. Wow. <laughs> that's it well i love it <laughs> you know we were talking about before the early messages so like hashem implanted in you this distaste for mediocrity to show you your greatness and this Absolutely. rebellious nature to make you brave you've done a lot of brave things i can't tell you how much joy i have when mm. i see that i impact someone else and reveal within them reveal the angel that's embedded and they sees being mediocre and they they discover their voice mm. their song mm. and they have the courage to sing it it gives me the greatest nachs uh, unbelievable then i feel like i've unclogged and helped somebody find themselves yes 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 got it i feel it so um thank you for that answer well, what drives you inner if I engine. what drives you i'll give you my own analogy so it's really hard for me to get all the pieces of my life, like, you know how it is. I, I'm a mother and I'm a wife and, I'm a, and I cook and I clean and I teach and I write and it's like all the pieces. So there is one time where I find incredible peace and focus and that is on Friday. On Friday, I'm like, yay, Shabbos is coming. Now I know what to do. I don't have to choose what to do. I don't have to figure out am I public, am I private, am I, no. I'm going to clean and I'm going to cook for Shabbos and I'm going to try to make it in the most beautiful way I can. And suddenly I have time to call people and I'm, I'm so present because Shabbos is coming. That deadline is coming and I'm all in. So I, I'm in a stage right now where I experience life in the same way. Like Shabbos is coming. Redemption is coming. The world is going through unbelievable shit. So I'm all in. Like we must heal. For me, the Geula, the redemption, is a, it's a revelation of, ha- of God. And to me, that means of God's love. All of this is love. And if I, I think of it like a teenager. If a teenager feels really lousy about themselves, and you say, I love you, honey. They're like, get out of here, ma. Could I just have money for pizza? Oh, honey, don't you understand? Of course we love you. We just spent $20,000 on tuition. We give you everything. Thanks, I know, but could I go to my room? Like you, they cannot receive the love. So the love barely makes a dent. So for me, that this like what needs to happen in the world is like for Hashem, God to reveal himself and we need to be able to receive it. We have to really love ourselves and, and you know, repair this relationship with ourselves and with Hashem. So beautifully I'm, said, I'm, beautiful. Yeah. That's what drives me is the healing is like, can we please get people to feel good in a truthful way, not a pat on the back, to know about their greatness, like you're saying, to repair those early childhood wounds, to understand more about who God really is, because he did give us a very, very difficult life in exile. Like we got to understand these things deeply. And in a certain sense to repair like humankind's relationship with their creator, because it, it's, it's been rough, <laughs> you know, I, I want to you know. repair Exile is just another word for uh, displacement or dissonance. And it could be collective and it could be personal, individual. It's a dissonance. Oh. It's a disconnect. Yeah. And Geula, redemption, is a realignment and a reconnect and a yeah. unity, a seamlessness. Yeah. Oh, it's so beautiful. So, um, yes, that's what drives me. That's beautiful. It. Very yeah. nice. And it's a gift. It's a pure, it's a pure gift to have this clarity. Like I said, you know, um, 
it's like a it's a time for clarity. I've always been a person who wants to reach out and be inclusive and be loving and giving, but now it's a it's time for clarity that each of us has a mission within this. You know, it's not just like we're not only a collective. Um, one of the exciting things for me, you know, when you were saying how when you when someone's greatness is revealed and they step out of mediocrity, you like so exciting for you. So for me, when someone um, like is on the journey of getting the aha moment and getting realigned with themselves, aha, I am precious. And then the next aha of this is my mission, like I'm on mission when they're ignited to their mission, it's it's like the most exciting thing for me. So we do a lot of that, like kind of launching people into themselves. And um, beautiful, that's excellent. Well, you know the the Shabbos analogy you're giving, or the experience, I should say, is really captures it all. Six days of the week we're immersed in a material world with the challenges and battles, and the point is to reveal the Shabbos within the weekdays, to mm. reveal the holy within the mundane. Mm. And that's really what it comes down to. Can you say more about that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, some people say, why can't we have six days of the week Shabbos and one work day? You know, <laughs> but that's not the way God planned it. He wanted to create a world like we discussed earlier, where the divine is concealed in order for us to work hard mm -hmm. and reveal the truth that's lies embedded in this uh, material or even hostile universe. So the six days of the week are part of that purpose. We enter into work day, each person their own day, what the work they're doing, and we can get distracted and we can have experience uh, dissonance. We can experience fragmentation. As you mentioned here, you're a mother or a father a wife and a worker, a writer and this. But the purpose of it all is to remember that within these six lies hidden a Shabbat, a beautiful, tranquil serenity of unity that's meant to be emerging from all this uh, diversity. Yeah. And you can call it harmony within diversity. That's the purpose of it all. And each of us in our own way, when we achieve that, we are fulfilling the purpose and the calling for which we were created. Each mm. of us has our own particular corner of the world. It's really bringing Shabbos into the week. They're bringing unity into diversity. Beautiful. So you're saying in order to bring unity to, to, into diversity, you need to be unified within you so that it's you that travels through all of these pieces of life rather than, because um, you started out with this, who am I question, you know? If I am a worker, then at the moment that I'm doing my dishes, I'm not content, you know? Or at the moment that I'm going to help someone, oh, it's taking me away from my work. But if who I am is my essential soul self, a piece of Hashem here to bring light, then yes, it all is unified with that theme. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, that's exactly right. And that's, uh, that's what makes it so powerful and beautiful. And uh, that's why the redemption is called the day when it will be Kule, all Shabbos, all peace, all tranquility mm -hmm. and harmony mm -hmm. that will permeate all of our consciousness and all our existence. Beautiful, all purpose. So I want to wrap up now. And um, you have given over so many important messages, but it's still interesting for me um, to ask you. Imagine that you were on a stage, okay? And you just had 30 seconds. So <laughs> you've probably been on many, many stages. They give you a lot longer than 30 seconds, but today you only have 30 seconds. What's your message to the people? And what's the impact that it has on them? Oliver Wendell Holmes has a poem called The Voiceless, which he begins with this very tragic line. He says, alas, to those that die with their song still inside them. You have a unique song and melody, many melodies to sing that you and you alone can do. This is what life is all about to remember that you have that uniqueness and then to have the courage to express it, not to please someone else. You're not a product of other people's expectations or demands or critique. You have that beauty and the symphony of life, the cosmic symphony cannot be complete until you'll sing your song. 
So we all need you. We all need each other because we all complement each other. But never forget that indispensable. Every element, every morning when you're awake, say or think or meditate. Thank you for returning my unique soul to me and giving me another day renewing my contract with the indispensable contributions that I can and will bring to this world. Mm, so gorgeous. Thank you. You have a unique song without which the world cannot exist. Well, Rabbi Jacobson, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for having me. Very special. For allowing me into the inner feminine circle of your audience. <laughs> my, my feminine friends, if you would like to go on this journey further, if you want to really find out about your own greatness, wherever you are, there's more and there's more and there's more. Um, come and join us. We're starting our new training in a week and a half at the School of Coaching and Transformation. And everything that, we'll be, that we have spoken about here, you will live into within the program. I'm very, very excited. Um, Rabbi Jacobson, can you give us a bracha, a blessing for this new semester of students? It's, it's looking like it's going to be big. More excited. Absolutely. I give you my blessing. May God bless that the bringing together of souls, the communion, and each in their own unique way should create a synergy that's more than the sum of the parts that each of you should uh, discover deeper dimensions of your soul and its mission and that you should recognize why you were put on this earth. May the semester go well, may all the classes go well, may it truly resonate and above all may it have a perpetual effect on each of your lives forever and ever. Amen. If people want to listen to you every day, where can they do that? One stop place for everything, meaningfullife.com. It's one word, meaningfullife.com. There's an array, a robust schedule of events and programs, plenty. Check us oh. out and feel free to write or communicate. So happy for people. Thank you. Thank you for all that you put out. You really put your heart and soul into it. May Hashem, may God bless you with continued health continued drive, motivation, continued support, and may all of your wildest, most revolutionary dreams come to reality. Amen. Thank you. And everybody be well and healthy and use these challenges to become greater people. Amen. Thank you. Bye-bye.